Um, yes, I, I, I am truly uh, honored to be invited to speak about ideas that are powered by passion, and I to agree that it's it's a um, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for those of us in Cape Breton to hear the stories of fellow Cape Bretoners and and what is possible. And um, I um, when I was asked to talk about this particular subject, I really had to kind of distill and think about what is it, what is the passion that motivates me? Uh, what, why do I do what I do? And um, I distilled it down to one word, um, which was injustices. Um, so even as a young adult, it is something that I could not sit still with if I so thought that there was some injustice whether it be in my small community of Marguerite in Cape Breton, or be the larger community of Cape Breton, or Nova Scotia, or Canada, or wherever it was. So, um, but where did that come from? Um, and so I uh, wanted to just uh, talk about a relative of mine, and I feel kind of certain in this crowd that most of you know who this gentleman is, uh, Reverend Moses Cody, my grand uncle, certainly a man that inspired me and I think inspired many in my family and many in Cape Breton Island. The Father Moses Cody was a priest, but more than that he was an educator. And Father Moses Cody, uh, you know, from from my memory, uh, he was one that pointed out that it is injustices that he saw in his midst during the Depression. He talked a lot about illiteracy and poverty. He, and he specifically, one of the areas that he talked about was the fishermen in Canso. And uh, so he and Father Jimmy Tompkins were two individuals that um, wanted very much to lift people out of poverty. And his work, uh, what they called the Great Social Laboratory, uh, got a lot of the world's attention in, in, in the various ways that he worked. Uh, one of his, uh, one of the things that Father Cody talked about that I rem I mean, I remember Moses Cody, he died in 1959, so that tells you my vintage, but I do remember the man as, as a very, very powerful, large man in many dimensions. And he always said, if you're poor enough to want it, you're sm and smart enough to get it. And this was something that, uh, you know, one of his many great, great sayings that really inspired me. Um, Father Moses Cody also was very troubled by injustices, and he, his answer to that was critical literacy, that that could address injustice, lift people out of poverty. And one thing I want to share with you that I was just telling my daughter as we drove down in the car tonight, that Father Jimmy Tompkins, who was a, a colleague of Moses Cody's, but he was a much smaller man, he had kind of a squeaky voice, he, didn't ha he wasn't the orator that Moses Cody was, so he didn't get the attention that Moses Cody got. But one of the things that Moses Cody said about Father Jimmy Tompkins was that he, he, he talked about him as uh, he would create an uncomfortable uh, companion for the content. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's wonderful. And I hope that I do that. <laughs> so, I also want to thank New Dawn for this opportunity and the incredible work that they're doing. And they hold very high regard with many people who, who live in Cape Breton. Uh, may, we may not say it, but we have very high regard for New Dawn Enterprises. And I think many people that knew Moses Cody would 
in particular because the mission of New Dawn is to support a culture of self-reliance, much like Cody and Tompkins' great experiment of community development. So I think there's tremendous, uh, you know, I mean, it lives on with New Dawn Enterprises, in, in my opinion. So Moses Cody, he inspired me, but more than Moses Cody was after Moses Cody's passing, there was the formation of the Cody International Institute and the great experiment of the Antigonish movement. So what joy for the 13 Cody children and my mother and father every year to have this pilgrimage of students. We came from a homogenous community. So for us to have this kind of contact every year with people of color, I mean, in Marguerite, <laughs> people that dressed differently, looked differently, spoke differently. So I mean, that was such an incredible experience. It built inside of me this incredible desire that I wanted to open my mind. I wanted to learn more about where did these people come from with all their ideas. And why are they coming here? What are they learning here and bringing back to their country? They used to talk at great length about the opportunities that they had. This is my mom, and this is a, actually, if you can believe it, a colleague that I knew when I lived in Papua New Guinea, who is now back in Cape Breton, learning about the co-op and credit union movement. And this would be very, uh, you know, this would, be the group that would come every year, the pilgrimage, to Marguerite to learn about Father Moses Cody and Jimmy Tompkins and to bring these very precious concepts back to their worlds throughout the world. So how could it not have an incredible influence on anybody? So fired up by these experiences year after year, my first chance come when, came when I graduated as a public health nurse. And I went to the Canadian Arctic. And what a world. A world different from the world that I grew up in. But it was still part of Canada. It was a world where people were experiencing incredible cultural shock. They had one foot in the developed world and one foot firmly entrenched in the lives that they knew in, uh, in the Arctic. So complete culture shock. From there I came back and as a young mother living in rural Nova Scotia, I experienced many injustices. For 10 years, my community and I fought to keep our school in our community, but we lost. We certainly used many of the techniques of Moses Cody and Jimmy Tompkins, the kitchen meetings, all the efforts to mobilize our community, but the powers to be were too great. We lost our schools. There were environmental issues, the herbicide trials in which Jim was a plaintiff. I applied to be a plaintiff, but I didn't make it to try to stop the application of, if you can believe it, Agent Orange on our forests. And the battles were just unending. It, uh, eventually, my husband and I had an opportunity to go as Canadian volunteers to, to Papua New Guinea. And we took our two young children, aged four and six, into a very remote area of Papua New Guinea. And it's a very beautiful country and people look like they're happy, but beauty is only skin deep. The people of Papua New Guinea, like many countries, are victims of colonialization and slavery, and they have very difficult, troubled, and short lives. And so our work as Canadian volunteers was ex extremely humble and it looks very idyllic, and it looks very beautiful. But in many of these 
beautiful idyllic southern um, in the South Pacific, life is incredibly difficult because of uh, much of the globalization and the effects of globalization on communities. So following my, uh, our work as Canadian volunteers and we came back to Canada, of course, I became very restless. And um, I had a calling and I was recruited by Oxfam Great Britain to travel to Haiti. I'm very interested in knowing uh, if I could just see a show of hands of anyone that has in fact visited Haiti here tonight. Okay. How about Dominican Republic? Yes. Okay. And the, the comparison of uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti are just quite unbelievable. Um, Haiti, uh, uh, Haiti, Haiti is a, a country that has suffered for many, many years the effects of political dictatorship, unrest, a complete collapse of law, order, and all social safety, nut, safety nets. It was probably my first experience to really witness extreme poverty. Certainly in the South Pacific, you could describe it as poverty, but people had land. People had a way of putting a meal on the table and of survival. But in, in countries like Haiti, uh, people are, uh, you know, it's human condition at its worst. But I went there because I had a skill that was in need. There was a massive flood. There was a large loss of life. And I just happened to have some of the skills that were needed to help people survive from the, the flood conditions, not from the really systemic human condition that exists. Um, these children who have the unfortunate fate of being born and raised in Haiti will have no future. But when they are, you know, they are born like children in any country. They have hopes, they have desires, they have wishes. But for them, there is a lot of despair because the future is very questionable. And very recently, I, I can't imagine that life could be worse than when I was there. And since then, they've had that massive earthquake. And then, if you survived the earthquake, you endured the cholera epidemic. So it's a story of total collapse and incredible injustices and a world that just can't get out of their way to, to try to lift a country like Haiti out of the despair that they are feeling. Just a word about my role there was in terms of humanitarian response. As I said, I was not there for the earthquake, but I was there for a massive flood. A flood because of the massive deforestation, the waters just came into the cities. And so our work was to provide very basic measures of providing drinking water, uh, latrines, hand washing, and hygiene education. But it was my first experience of, of uh, a country in absolute despair. And, uh, but for what reason did I want to continue to do this? It sounds like pretty depressing, <laughs> uh, pretty depressing uh, experience. Why would I want to continue? But. Uh, there is, just seems to be that, uh, I knew there was a need. I knew that I, fortunately, had the skills to maybe answer some of, of the need that, that was required. So we all know the terrible story of Darfur. And it is, continues to be a genocide in progress. In, it doesn't meet the UN description or definition of a genocide, but for most of the world, we know a genocide is occurring. And it's a, uh, 
people must live in um, camps in order to be protected from their own government. Rape is a common form of warfare. I have sat and had focus group discussions with groups of women from very young to what I thought looked very old. And on occasion, there have been uh, times when not one of the women that I was talking to had not been raped by they are by the agents of the government that want to make the Darfurian population disappear. Uh, I don't have a lot of pictures because the government was very hostile to the international community. It's only because of international humanitarian law that we were in, allowed to be in Darfur. Uh, so I don't, they do not want us taking a lot of pictures, so I don't have a lot of evidence of what actually happened there. But it was uh, uh, my first experience of living in a culture, in a community where people lived under Sharia law. My first experience of living in a population where in a country where there is very little separation between church and state where both promote polygamy and a very diminished role of women and children. And so it was, again, another situation of hopelessness and despair. And so again, you know, the word injustice, an entire society. Just a word about my role there. My role there was, again, one of uh, being a public health advisor for Oxfam. So we were trying to provide the very basic necessities to keep families safe, to keep them safe from waterborne and sanitation-related diseases. So we provide drinking water, hand washing, latrine service, and just very basic shelter. And this is all in the confines of camps. If people ventured outside of the camps, they were often attacked by uh, sponsor, uh, rebels sp sponsored by the government. And uh, you know, it was a very, very hostile environment for international aid workers. So my, my most recent uh, mission was in, has been in Pakistan. Pakistan has a population of 172 million people. Again, I do not have a lot of pictures because you're not allowed to freely travel around the country snapping pictures of what it is that you see. So I had few pictures I could take the pictures that I could get from colleagues of mine. But if you look at right from the north to the south, there was a huge flood. And it just came right through the country from north to south. And it was a swath of about 75 to 100 kilometers that came down through the country and just devastated everything in its path. I had actually been in Pakistan one on one other occasion. I was in Kashmir, on the Pakistan side of Kashmir, where there had been a very large loss of life, where entire populations were lost, and much infrastructure in, in um, Kashmir. I would say in Pakistan, it's a place where you would find the poorest of the poor you would find massive number, well, when you're talking about 172 million people, I mean, massive number of subsistence farmers and people just trying to eke out a living. People like these two gentlemen that were at a meeting that I was at, trying to understand how the international community could assist them. 
people that have been displaced by earthquakes, and people that have been displaced by many military operations. The area in which the earthquake occurred, or the flooding occurred, was in the Swat Valley, and that's where I was located. And this is Taliban country. And there were many, many bombings trying to root out Osama bin Laden, and people were displaced already and living in very temporary housing when, when the flooding came. So essentially these people lost everything and are fully dependent on the international community because they have a, a government that cares very little about whether they live or die. And I, I, I will just quickly go through a few images of what I saw when I went to Pakistan, and then I'll just kind of summarize some of my feelings about some of my missions with Oxfam. Um, so this is a, a person that's just showing me how high the flood waters were when they came. And some of the people uh, that, uh, in, in the various camps that I visited, um, when I arrived, it was three weeks after the flood, and what I found was everywhere, as far as the eye could see, was about three to four feet of sludge. The waters left, but it left about three feet of sludge. It was filled with debris, so when you would look around, it, the debris would be filled with everything from bits of furniture, school books, clothing, domestic animals, people's bodies, and it was uh, a very large cleanup to just try to remove all the debris that had infiltrated in every building, every house, every house in, in, in the area. So some of the things that are, again are really required are um, water, to provide drinking water. So we uh, tried to offer um, filter systems. I'll, I'll just point out that the filter systems is a household solution to water. And why a household solution? Because it is such a strict Muslim community that women are not permitted outside of the courtyard, outside the gates of their home. They will never see the outside. They will be covered and they will never see the outside. So you have to provide a response that meets the need at a household level. Also, latrines. So you could not build large community uh, latrines. They had to be household because they could not leave the courtyard. They're just simply not permitted. The uh, women and young children cannot ever leave within the confines of, of, of their courtyard, so you had to provide solutions. And of course, you'll probably notice it's mostly all men here, because any of the community-based public education would be targeted at men, because you probably would not find too many women that were allowed to move outside of the confines of their home uh, for any public education. And. Uh, this was a very joyful time to go into the schools and work with children about the, the necessity of a very, very basic public health measure, which is hand washing, which is probably the one thing I spent over 50% of my time doing, just reinforcing the importance of hand washing. And then there's distribution. As I said, they lost everything, so there was, it was important to be able to provide very basic, basic uh, shelter and basic <coughs> hygiene equipment. So a few, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the city Peshawar. We hear about it a lot. There's a lot of suicide bombings there. And that was the area that I was based in. Uh, so these are just a few images of uh, you see, weapons not allowed because every, everybody carries a gun and there's police everywhere. It's so militarized. It's a country with 172 million people, but as you can see, uh, you know, this is uh, 
traffic. So it's still very underdeveloped. And death is ever present. And um, this struck me, you know, that this is a very commercial commodity on, this, on the highways. People are, try, are, are selling uh, these boxes because this is something that's very commonplace in people's lives. But what I wanted to just uh, uh, summarize my um, conversation with you tonight was about um, what I uh, what impacts on me or what I think is the greatest impact is how women and young girls are affected throughout the world in, in many countries, uh, not entirely Muslim, but certainly in countries where there is uh, Sharia law. And uh, I'm, um, you know, women bear the brunt of much of the injustices. Um, the lives of women and young girls is not a life that you would want for your sister or for your daughter or your granddaughter. It's, it's, um, it's a very difficult life. Um, polygamy is legislated by the state. Arranged marriages are just common practice. I just wanted to, to, to share with you a story of uh, I did live in a house with other Pakistani women, and um, they were so intrigued that I didn't wasn't that I was married, but it wasn't an arranged marriage. And they were very, very keen to understand what's it like a love marriage. What's that like? <laughs> and they were so amazed about the whole uh, ritual of courting, because that is not from the time they're a young child, they know who they're going to marry, and there is no such a thing as any kind of a mating ritual. You just marry this person, so you move from your parents' yard to your husband's yard, and procreate, and life goes on. And so, for these young women, they were very intrigued about what is a, is a love marriage like. So, because I'm so happily married, I was able to tell them, yes, I know all about a love marriage. <laughs> um, no contact with the outer world. The vast majority of Muslim women living in such countries as Pakistan. And they are dressed in the full burqa. And so that's a difficult life in a full burqa. And even when I was trying, to, I was doing some training about hygiene and sanitation and how to treat water and things like that. All my, the women that I was working with were under, in, under burqas. So I really didn't make a connection with my students because I didn't, couldn't see them. And when we would break for lunch or coffee break, they would take a chair, face the wall, and then lift their little thing off their face and have their tea and eat, but they wouldn't let anyone else see them. And I was completely horrified when I saw that. Like they faced the wall. They couldn't, you know, converse with their colleagues and other men for sure. <coughs> so I asked them one day, well, how do you know? Like, if you have a friend, like we all grow up and we make friends, like, how do you know when you meet your friend on the street? They're under a burqa. How do you know who they are? And their response to me was, you get to know their shoes. <laughs> and that was like, I was really struck by that. And then I said, that's why I see so many shoe stores. Shoes are a big deal. Burkas aren't, but shoes are. Because they know each other from their, their shoes. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it when it, your relationship is reduced to knowing someone through the shoes they wear. It's uh, quite amazing. Uh, and you know, very, very few com creature comforts. I think many would not know what a creature comfort was. 
life in my, you know, from, from where I am, seemed to be a very difficult one. So I just want to end by saying what, what is my passion in all of this and why would somebody continue to want to participate in missions like this? Because certainly I cannot change what I see and all the huge, what I think are inequities. But certainly if you don't know any different, then they're not inequities to you. So if change has to work, will occur, it must not occur from the outside, but from a desire within. So having that context, when I go to these various countries, I have learned to try to seek out allies, men or women, who I think have a position in life that they can be the change agents and that maybe they can someday master their own destiny and that they can be the change they want to see. And that challenge is really daunting with the massive number of humanitarian crisis we're seeing today. It's overwhelming on our planet and we are now witnessing huge humanitarian crisis throughout Africa with all the efforts uh, by many countries to seek democracy. So I take my passion from these people, but I also take my passion from Moses Cody, and I take my passion from such organizations and the good work of New Dawn and people I meet every day in Marguerite, in Sydney, wherever I am. And that's what I have to say. Thank you very much.